Khadija. Hey guys. <laughs> Looking beautiful, Khadija on the top. I love it. Hi. All right. We're going to get started. I think we're live. Welcome everyone to the Rising Up Sudan event. This is part of our ongoing Rising Up for Human Dignity film and discussion and performance series. We're so happy to have you here. I'm Ruth Ann Butler. I'm the media events coordinator for the Never Again Coalition. And on behalf of us and all of our co-presenters, we're really thrilled to welcome all of our viewers here tonight, whether you're joining us live or whether you're tuning in for our um, recorded version of this programming. Just wanna share a few opening remarks before we get started. And I would like to begin with a land acknowledgement. This is just a little twist on what you may have experienced for land acknowledgements in the past, but as we're all living in kind of a new context due to the COVID-19 pandemic, the Rising Up for Human Dignity Film and Discussion Series has become a completely online event as many of the events in our lives have. With that in mind, we'd like to acknowledge that our organizers, performers, panelists, and audience members are able to participate in this programming by using devices that contain in their essential components tin, tungsten, tantalum, and gold, which are known as conflict minerals. Fueled by corporate greed, consumer demand, government policies, and inaction by the international community, the extraction from the earth and the sale of conflict minerals has motivated and perpetuated armed conflict and contributed to societal instability, rape, and other forms of extreme violence, particularly in the Democratic Republic of Congo. We are so grateful for the means of communication and connection that rely on these precious resources and affirm our commitment to use them to advocate for justice, accountability, and restoration of peace and stability in the lands of their origin. And tonight and through the whole month of July, we are highlighting Sudan and its diaspora with panel discussions, performances, and films. A little more than a year has passed since the peaceful revolution in Sudan brought an end to the dictatorship of Omar al-Bashir. In this series, we're privileged to be able to hear from many artists and activists who will share their perspectives on the revolution and the continuing progress of Sudan toward democracy and civilian rule. Tonight, we'll start the series with performance and conversation with some really amazing artists. We're so excited to have you all. It's a real honor that you're sharing your work with us. Let me introduce our hosts for the evening, then we'll get started. Bentley Brown is the director of Faisal Goes West, Ustaz, and First Feature. He grew up in Chad and began making films there as a teenager. From 2009 till 2011, he lived in Sudan, where he was working across 10 states with the Carter Center's International Monitoring Delegation for the 2009-2010 elections, the referendum on South Secession, and the popular consultations in Blue Nile and South Kordofan. He's currently completing a PhD in Emergent Technologies and Media Arts Practices at the University of Colorado Boulder, and he's the director of Revolution from Afar, which will be screening next week. Finally, it's really great to have you here tonight, and I'll turn it over to you. Awesome. Uh, thank you, Ruthann. Uh, it is a delight to be part of this, uh, essentially a month-long uh, screening and discussion series, Rising Up Sudan. Uh, I'm very grateful to Never Again Coalition for the opportunity to not only participate in tonight's event as a moderator, but also to host the screening of Revolution from Afar next week, in which we'll be able to engage with audiences, uh, as well as celebrate the, the many people who are part of that film. Some of them are here tonight. Uh, Never Again Coalition had originally approached me to include Revolution from Afar in the Rising Up uh, Human Dignity film series that, that took place in May uh, alongside uh, up work such as For Sama and I Am Rohingya. But they quickly tossed, out, tossed around the idea that we do a whole separate series uh, of events focused on Sudan and the Sudanese Revolution. And it's really an honor to be a part of this. Uh, I'm very honored uh, and delighted for Revolution from Afar to screen alongside uh, these other two films, Rupa Gogineni's I Am Bisha, which I caught at the uh, Sheffield uh, Film Festival uh, a couple years ago and was uh, laughing my <clears throat> uh, rear end off uh, in this like media library place. Amazing, amazing, amazing piece. Um, and then Marwa Zen's uh, Khartoum Offside, which is a very accomplished film um, one that I'm very excited for, a very brave film, and, and it's an honor to be even in the remote category as those, as those works. As we kick off what is essentially a month-long series of not only film screenings, but also important discussions around identity and the role of art in activism, tonight's guests are 
all performers uh, featured in Revolution from a Farm, which made its premiere this year at this year's Sudan Independent Film Festival in January before the COVID lockdown, and was also featured in Vision du Réel in the online media library. About the film, in 2019, after months of protests across Sudan, the military removed 30-year dictator Omar al-Bashir and cracked down after that in a violent fashion on a civilian sit-in outside its headquarters in Khartoum. The internet was shut down, leaving those outside of Sudan to voice a plea for peaceful transition to civilian government. An ocean away, Sudanese-American poets and musicians whose families left Sudan for America in decades past, gathered in major American cities to perform in support of the revolution. At the heart of the film, Revolution from Afar, is a conversation around identity, belonging, as well as the uncertain future of Sudan, from which these artists, these performers, have been physically cut off. What happens when one can only watch from afar? This is one of the central questions of the film. And I do want to make, uh, I guess, offer a note that if anyone's watching with young ones, there may be some serious topics, some heavy topics, some references to, uh, to violence, political violence and physical violence. So just a heads up um, for the younger audiences. Uh, I will go ahead and begin introducing our guest tonight. For each guest, uh, I'll introduce the artist and I'll have them share a piece maybe ask a follow-up question or two, and then we'll reconvene at the end to answer questions on Q&A from the audience. Our guests tonight are Khadija Muhammad, Bayad al-Muhammad Osman, Rami Daoud, and Zainab. Uh, each will share a piece with you um, that we, I've given, we give them complete freedom to choose what they share. Um, there are going to be questions that may arise related to the piece, as well as the overall experience of what it's been like to uh, be an artist performing throughout this, this whole time. Um, so I, I really do encourage the audience to contribute questions that are inspired by the piece that's performed, but also uh, that may be on your mind in terms of the overall uh, events of the last year. All right, if we're ready to begin, we'll start this evening with uh, Khadija Muhammad. Khadija, I remember, <laughs> I'm going to share a little, little bit of a uh, note for each of our participants as well after I, after I uh, introduce their bios. Um, guys, uh, I don't have a piece myself, a spoken word piece. I don't have a song to share tonight, but I was sent uh, 500 word long bios from each of our participants here. <laughs> so I'm going <laughs> to consider that to be my piece. Um, uh, Khadija, thanks for unmuting. I do want to make a note that if anyone would like to unmute uh, during the introductions as well as during the performances, that this could be a, an opportunity to provide a little bit of human interaction in our Zoom performative space. Khadija is a spoken word artist and a community organizer. She was born in Sudan and raised in Saudi Arabia. Um, her experiences there pushed her to speak up against oppression and bigotry of all forms. Khadija is currently a student at Wayne State University pursuing a degree in political science, and she has been performing nationally and internationally for over five years now. This is the condensed version of the bio. Now, I do want to give a little story about Khadija as we start off here. Um, we, we met at the SAPA conference in Denver. Yes. Uh, conveniently was down the street from where I'm doing my PhD in Boulder. And uh, Khadija had, had performed in front of this huge crowd. I was filming at the time in the hopes that what I was collecting in footage could become some sort of a piece, maybe a short film, and it's expanded this feature project. And uh, like a total goof, I missed Khadija's performance. <laughs> Didn't record anything. So uh, when you see the film Revolution from Afar, you'll notice that there's, there are these long, in-depth intellectual conversations about the psychological impact, uh, the, what it means to feel the revolution from afar. And, and I've tried my best to incorporate performances. I didn't have anything for Khadija. So the last day um, before Khadija was going to head to the airport, she very uh, graciously agreed to give a performance for the camera. And we went looking for a space to do it, just a quiet space in this, this giant conference mm -hmm. hotel. I had scouted out this like super, this like huge empty basement of the Sheraton downtown Denver. And it was really impressive. It looks like a giant like Turkish masjid or something. Like it's just like empty spaces as far as I can see. And when we went down there, 
<laughs> there are people setting up a conference, but we couldn't perform anything. <laughs> um, Khadija couldn't perform. So, so we finally found this little nook over here. It looked really nice, a little bit of like symmetry in the frame behind her. And she starts performing this really emotional piece. And this random guy, who, there's no reason he should be in this corner of the hotel. He doesn't work for the hotel. He's not setting up the conference, nothing. With a little suitcase, walks from the basement of the hotel and keeps calling an elevator for like two minutes, no, knowing the, the bell's ringing, knowing we're recording. And the grace with which Khadija handled the situation was impressive. And I hope this guy, whoever he is, I hope that her poetry lingers with him and that he's a changed man so. today. <laughs> Khadija, you have Thank the floor. You. We are delighted and honored to have you here. And we'll catch up with you in a second when you're done. Thank you. Thank you so much for that introduction, Bentley. Um, I got you since you missed my performance that day. I'm performing it again for you today. Lucky so me. now I'm missing it. So you go be here for it, inshallah. So um, this piece that I'm going to perform is that piece that Bentley was talking about in the film, uh, Revolution from Afar. Um, so it's called Between. So without further ado, I'll start, inshallah. Yaza, I, stay, I still hate water. This past summer, I just went back to Sudan after 12 years of being gone, after 12 years of trying to figure out where I belong, after 12 years of trying to hold on to my motherland, to my Arabic tongue, to my culture and what I remember of Sudan trying to hold on to the slowly dissipating memories of home. I didn't know what to expect, didn't know if my family would accept or reject me, didn't know if I was still Sudanese enough. We landed in the airport in, our, in Khartoum and I rushed to the line that says citizens, my eyes glistening with tears of joy that I'm finally back home or what I thought is home back to where I was born. And when I got to the counter, I was immediately encountered by a letter of rejection. He asked to see my Sudanese passport to prove my identity and it didn't dawn on me that my passport was no longer green, rather it was navy blue when stamped on it as American dream. He looked at me and said, this isn't the line where you belong. He then pointed to the line with a sign above it that said, foreigners. I wanted to scream, no, you're wrong in America. I also don't belong, so where am I supposed to go when in both lands I can't claim home? Memories immediately flooded back to that one time when I was six years old and when my cousin suggested we go swim in the body of water that gave birth to us. I remember darkness all around me when my foot slipped and I fell underneath, struggling to breathe, gasping for air, hoping someone hears my silent screams. No, I'm falling. No, I'm sinking. No, I'm drowning. I was drowning in the Nile. And now I'm still drowning in denial of which identities are meant to be. Drowning in denial of what society tells me trying to swim between American and Sudanese, between two lands that were never meant to meet, between chaos and peace, between Nubia Mountains and the Statue of Liberty, between two cultures, two tides, between two mountains that slowly collide, between Arabic tongue and black skin, between Alif Bata and ABC, between white dope and black dress between la kida ab and no that's okay between wab alayhi and oh my god between wardi and tupac between pizza and asida bamulah between lost and found between somewhere and nowhere drowning between water and air because how can i breathe when in both lands i am suffocating ta'rifi azza I still hate water till this day. I'm tired of drowning in between. With you, I'm yearning to be. Help me. The wave stopped. I find myself now floating in the Nile, 
My eyelid, eyelids felt heavy and I couldn't open them, but I knew my body swayed with the sound. I tried to listen and hear that sound, but somehow my ears were still underwater. I can only hear muffled screams and vibrant darkness. And the more the sound grew louder, the more that I tried to lift my head above water. And after years, I decided to just let go, stop struggling, stop resisting, stop fighting. I let the waves guide me. I let the tides of change take me. My eyes and body all weighed so heavy, but I still moved steady. My body moved, my body swayed. My body moved to the shore that now didn't seem too far away. The voices of children, voices of women, voices of Kandaka's future, past and present, the Zagrutas of my Habobas, the lullaby of hope, the voices of those who have awakened the revolution slowly bringing me to shore. Ya Azza, I am so close. They try to tie bricks to my ankles to sink me, to stop me, to silence me. But what they didn't know is that you can try to drown bodies, but you can't drown truth. Because I am still here today. We are still here today. I can hear everything loud and clear. Ana Afriqi wa ana Sudani. Ana Afriqi wa ana Sudani. Ana Afriqi wa ana Sudani. I opened my eyes only to find my cousin pulling me out of the water. He held me near, told me you were gone for 12 years, but I'm now glad you're here, Yazza. I still hate water till this day, but this was necessary to getting me to my destination because you see, water connects and it does not separate. Time doesn't run, but rather it waits because you see, just because I'm in between, in between two bodies of water doesn't mean I can't have two shores. And just be because I'm American and Sudanese doesn't mean I'm not enough for both. Because you see, in between sinking, I learned how to rise. In between drowning, I learned how to float. In between American, I learned how to be Sudanese. And in between suffocating, I learned how to truly breathe. Thank you. Wow. <laughs> you guys feel free to unmute. Feel free to unmute after each person performs or thank even you. during. Thank you. thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you for inviting me here today. Every time I do this piece, I get into the zone and I get so like emotional. So <laughs> but thank you. There's this. Uh, idea in, in you know filming especially like in the documentary realm that you want to keep rolling as much as possible but your your instinct of like when to cut is probably too early just keep going a few seconds and when Khadija finished performing this for the camera for the film I was sitting there frozen tears streaming I, and this guy this guy in the elevator I don't know I'm, I hope he was crying too and, <laughs> oh god um, but I think something's very powerful here Khadija and the way that this piece speaks to many different experiences. So you're referencing places that are particular to you and experiences that are particular to you, but I think there's something that a lot of people who have uh, tried to balance more than one place, more than one culture will, will really identify with in this piece. Um, I, I wanna ask you a couple quick questions before we move on um, to the next performer. Thank you so much for performing. Um, this is, as always, uh, very moving. And um, in regards to the idea of identity here, um, I'm very curious if you see parallels in the way in which people are discussing attachment to the Sudanese revolution, um, and particularly the diaspora, um, those living outside of Sudan, and then what we're also witnessing today with the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, mm -hmm. I personally, um, I feel like ho hopefully most people <laughs> are in agreement <laughs> that police brutality 
uh, and systemic racism are something that we should all be standing up against right now. But once we have sort of agree on that, I've noticed many different sort of factions of philosophy and people, uh, you know, my, my social network, my friends are you know, from mostly like Sudan, Chad, Saudi Arabia, US, these kind of spaces. And there's, there's a very complex uh, discussion around surrounding identity. Um, ha have, you, have you noticed similarities as well? Have you endured some of the similar struggles to yeah. express uh, during the current uh, yeah. revolution? Yeah, definitely. I see a lot of parallels happening now with what's going on with Black Lives Matter movement. Uh, it kind of the feeling that I'm feeling right now is a similar feeling to what I was feeling with the Sudanese revolution. And it is this kind of awakening, this new, new uh, vision for yourself and for, for your people and for the future, right? So um, definitely it feels like, you know, we couldn't catch the revolution in Sudan, but this is our chance now to catch the revolution here in America. Uh, I felt the same type of vibes. I felt the same energy. And I felt the same level of hope, right? Level of hope that is ignited within me now, seeing people protesting. And it kind of, it's interesting because people are protesting and having weddings at the protests, just like they were having pro uh, weddings in Sudan in the, during the protests. And um, you see people like just staying outside, just like they're doing in Sudan and helping one another in that way. Um, and it kind of like, the other parallel here is that even though we live in a democracy here in America, it kind of feels like the similar dictatorship to Omar al-Bashir's regime in Sudan, right? So all of these parallels are kind of like hitting me in the face and I'm just like, whoa, like we're literally living through the history that we lived through before, but now we are even more an important aspect of this revolution here in America because we are here. It's in our backyards, it's down our streets, right? So here, we're definitely like the pens crafting history right now uh, in this moment. So uh, for me, I'm just as fiery about um, the, this revolution awakening in America, just as I was about the revolution in Sudan. I'm very hopeful for both of them. Awesome, thank you. Uh, also, I just wanna encourage the audience to submit questions to the Q&A. We'll actually address in a section after the performances. Um, I did notice there was someone pointed out there was a question about Black Lives Matter in the Q&A. So great job, Bentley. God, you have to skip all the questions that people are asking already. But we will devote time to those um, for a, a deeper discussion at the end. So thank you. And please keep submitting those. Um, one last question, Khadija, really quickly. I, I, people can already tell you're a very vibrant person. You're very expressive. Uh, and you're funny as, as hell. Can I say hell? You're funny as hell. All right. And um, uh, I really appreciate the way you enli enlivened a lot of our discussions. Uh, last year around the revolution with your own personal stories and personal narratives, one of which the passport line in Khartoum you addressed in your piece. Yeah. How do you balance the humor and the realness, uh, the lightness even, of some of those experiences with the gravity of the issues you're addressing in your poetry? That's a heavy question. I think for me, I use humor to deal with these heavy topics, right? Because you know, I was, I was here in America feeling, for the longest time, I wouldn't say I'm American. I would just say, I'm a Sudanese. I wouldn't claim American, right? Because I was like, I was born in Sudan. That's my home. Those are my people, right? And so I rolled up to the airport in Sudan with that expectation in mind that, you know, I'm coming back to my people, to my country, and they're going to welcome me with open arms from the airport, right? And I talked about it in the piece where I was at the counter. I was like, hold up, wait. I don't have the Sudanese passport. And isn't it so sad that we define identity by that piece of paper, right? And so the guy looked at me, he was like, I don't know what to tell you. This is not where you belong. And it was kind of like a punch to my face. It was just so disheartening to hear um, that now in Sudan, they don't view me as Sudanese anymore, right? Where I said in America, they also don't see me as American. So it was kind of a moment of like, very deep introspection into the question of who am I? Who do I claim? Who is going to claim me, right? So I deal with it with humor. I try to laugh it off uh, when we were talking about it uh, during the panel discussions, but the, the reality is it really hurts. It's a painful experience um, when, when you go in with that expectation that, you know, that's my people and uh, you, you view them like that and, and you expect them to welcome you with the same energy but that doesn't happen. Although I have to say that 
even though I didn't see my family for 12 years, they welcomed me as if nothing happened. And so that was something beautiful, seeing the ties of family, how that transcends any time or distance. And there's so much beauty in that, regardless of what happened at the airport with just my identity being on paper, which is just something so ridiculous um, that we have to live with. Thank you again, Khadija. One last thing. Are you, where are you physically right now in the world? Where am I right now? I am in Canton, Michigan. Ooh. This is where I'm at right now. <laughs> All right. Awesome. We have a very spread out uh, contribution of performers tonight. So I'm, I'm really curious. I met my visiting family in Dallas, um, Texas, which is the capital of the coronavirus. All right. Let's <laughs> move on to... Thank you, Bentley. Let's move on to Bayadr. Thank you, Khadija. Um, Bayadr Muhammad Usman is a public health professional, activist, and poet based in Maryland. She graduated from American University with a bachelor's in public health and has dedicated uh, her research to preventing health disparities. So we should have a follow-up panel on the distribution of remdesivir and addressing the COVID-19 <laughs> um, as a spoken word artist, she has competed at College Union Poetry Slam Invitational alongside AU's Speak Fresh. But yeah, that has been featured on Now This and AJ Plus. She uses her platform and voice to advocate for marginalized communities and her home country, Sudan. So uh, I have to give my story, my personal uh, anecdote to Bayadr. <laughs> Uh, we met in, I think it was technically Virginia, at a revolution. Oh, it was. Coinciding. Yep. Yeah, Khalid, Khalid al who, who had actually organized the Stumbling is Not Falling art exhibit in New York, um, who had been featured in that, and, and had come down to D.C. to give an event. But yeah, they performed there. Uh, you mentioned that you're going to Denver to the SAPA conference. <laughs> so uh, I, I went up and said, hey, if you're cool with it, let's continue the conversation there, so you can be part of the film. Um, and I don't really have much to say, uh, except that when we arrived in Colorado, there was one afternoon where everybody was going out to the mountains, to like the Red Rock. No, is that where the story's going? <laughs> and Bayadr was wearing the fanciest sandals you have ever seen. Um, and I just, I'm just curious, why fancy sandals when you're going hiking? Did, some, did you miss the memo? Or <laughs> I remember those sandals and they are no good anymore. I um was them, they're dirty now. So if you're wondering, you know, i you know, maybe my birthday next year you can get me some new sandals, Bentley. Uh sounds good. Yeah. But they're only good for like one hike apparently. So <laughs> all right. Uh Bayadr. Welcome. Ready. And the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you everyone for having me today. I'm a uh, performing a piece titled Secondhand Smoke, and it is the title of my debut poetry book, Secondhand Smoke. Um, it just got recently published a couple weeks ago. And, um, and yeah, it's titled Secondhand Smoke. About 54,000 people die from secondhand smoke a year. Some suggest it may be worse than firsthand. I didn't live through wars but I am the echo of my Sudanese lineage. I did not jump from country to country not knowing where home was, but I do know what smoke does. My family, all six of us, were chased out of our country. The government wanted my father dead. His scars are white, the peace on our flag. But the government has a master's in false propaganda. It's dead, Sudan is not in peace, but in two pieces. I wasn't raised on fairy tale stories about Cinderella, Rapunzel, and Snow White. I was ignited on biographies of my people, how my father resisted dictators, how my great grandfather fought imperialism, how he was friends with the great queen. I was raised to follow my dean. I was raised on what my parents had seen. My parents are my suppliers, addicting me to these stories like nicotine. Who needed to hear about superheroes saving the day? and helping the poor, when the only thing that saved my family was an American passport. Every room in my home I walk into, I'm engulfed into a thick fog. In my living room, I'm reminded that's where families gather for funerals. I've been to too many. Air is engulfed, but tears always find a way. 
I don't know if we cry for the lost souls or the fact that Sudan is on fire, mourning for the soul, but Sudan is dying to them too. Smog lingers in these rooms. You can't quit trauma, cold turkey. An American identity can't shield you from the gloom. Whoever walks into my home, we offer them chai, biscuits, a lighter, and ashtray. They kindle a few cigarettes and leave thick fumes to the point the blood of Sudanese genocides always fragrance my clothing. I don't have a first-hand experience, but I will always be the kid in the room that smells like smoke. 2.5 million people die from exposure to secondhand smoke between 1960 to 2014. How many of those do you think died in Sudan? I no longer blame them. Smoke is meant to be exhaled eventually. All right. Okay. Uh, I, one thing that impresses me a lot and I've seen your performances. Um, I didn't completely drop the ball in Denver. I actually recorded your uh, performance in front of the audience in Denver. Uh, is the energy that you convey. Um, you have a very tangible intensity when speaking. Uh, I can't help as an audience member but take you very seriously and be sort of like locked in. Um, I was curious though, as uh, someone who's sharing, what is it like with different audiences? Do you feel that certain audiences respect that and they connect in that sense? Uh, or is that not always the case? And how, how do you, what do you do to, to convey that level of energy maybe in different settings? Definitely. Um, that's a really excellent question, uh, Bentley. I definitely cater my performances based on the audience. And um, that could mean even even I enter a space and I tell myself, this is the poem I'm going to do. But by the time I feel the audience, I'm last minute decision. I change it. Initially, even with this event, initially I had another poem that I wanted to do. But then I really loved the introduction. Khadija's poem inspired me. So I wanted to do a poem about my identity and my Sudanese, um, the feelings I have of being a kid in the diaspora. So that's what I do as an artist. I cater to my audience, but also at the same time, I I protect my energy. It's not because I want to just please the audience. It's also because I, as a, a performer, I'm not going to put my heart on a stage if I don't feel like this is the message they want to receive. So there are certain spaces that um, when it comes to mental illness, or if the poem is about my mental illness or me going to a therapist or a breakup, I have to ensure that the audience is going to be respectful of the topic. So. Uh, touching on this idea of the Sudanese identity in particular, one of the things that you lament in Revolution from Afar is that something happened when you moved to the United States um, as a kid that you, you wound up translating a lot of documents for your family. You were the, like, the designated translator person. You helped them navigate that adjustment a lot. And, and a lot of it came at the cost of your own exposure uh, to Arabic and Sudanese Arabic. You're exposed to it, but you weren't, you weren't uh, given maybe the privilege of, of being able to live in an all Arabic speaking environment. Um, you're, you're very much balancing the liminal space between the two languages. And one thing that stuck with me is you mentioned even a lot of Arabic poetry that, that you don't necessarily connect with it. And that's something actually I, I feel like in even like the Arabic dialect I grew up speaking is very, uh, let's say far from the classical Arabic that's often used in poetry, and I, it just doesn't doesn't vibe with me. Um, but that's a pretty big observation. Like that's something that I feel like that might be kind of gutting to have that feeling of maybe missing missing out on something. Um, mm -hmm. How does this struggle impact your writing today? Oh yeah, this um, this conversation definitely it impacts my writing, impacts my relationship with my family. It impacts the way I see myself in terms of how Sudanese I am. It impacts me even academically. Um, I, I am advanced in English, but there was a time period what, where I was taking ESOL classes. And while my peers had English speaking parents, these are the high school students that I went to high school and college with. And 
these are the people that took the SAT with me. So I'm being compared to students who have all this exposure to English and access to English speaking parents. And um, well, I am competing at an unfair advantage where I'm the best speaking English, uh, I'm the best English speaker in my family. I have the best writing skills in my nuclear family. So it feels like I have to uplift my family along with me. And it comes at, it comes at a couple um, disadvantages, just like you noted. I don't have that connection to Arabic poetry. I don't have a connection to Arabic music. And I'm regularly reminded of that when I enter Sudan, when I have conversations with families. So I, yeah, in one of my poems, I actually have um, a line that says, another me is stranded across the ocean, the Sudanese girl that I could have been. And I always, I always think about the Sudanese person, the like Sudanese woman I could have been, because you know, this is, this is the Sudanese American, but I would love to, you know, had that experience to truly be connected to my language. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, Bayadu. Uh, we're going to move on now to Zainab. Zainab is a first generation uh, American with Sudanese parents. From upbeat jazz to eclectic soul, Zainab's sound is expressed by a blend of vocals, ukulele, and violin. Zainab has also teamed up with a band of classically trained, innovatively creative collection of musicians, which adds flute, piano, bass, guitar, and live percussion to her repertoire. Based in Denver, uh, her music is able to serve as a catalyst for deeper conversation and community activism. So now it's time for story time with Bentley. Uh, I also met Zainab last summer. We actually met before the SAPA conference. Again, the SAPA is uh, the Sudanese American Public Affairs Association that has an annual sort of mobile rotating conference. Uh, we met at a kind of a uh, fundraiser in Denver uh, in which I saw Zainab perform and I was like blown away. She's like whipping out like the violin. She's over here singing. It's like it's the, the, whole, the whole array, the whole toolkit of talents here. Zainab has a song called Double Life, which was uh, featured in Revolution from Afar. And uh, Double Life is, I think, if I get it right, it's referring to the whole struggle between the Sudanese and the American identity, like that sort of space in between both. And it was exemplified when we were returning from Red Rocks, the national park. Um, it was exemplified in, as Zainab was driving the car, she had to change clothes <laughs> <laughs> before we reached the place we were going. So we were like, we were out like hiking or whatever. And as I mentioned, some people had interesting clothing choices uh, earlier on. And as we're returning uh, to Denver, there's this massive protest. There's going to be like aunts and uncles out there, like the whole family's out there. So you, you usually choose a different attire. So Zainab, while driving the car, completes an entire change as the song is playing on the... I, I thought that was very... Uh, I don't know, poignant. Zainab, welcome, and we are eager to hear from you tonight. Thank you for joining us. Uh, hi, everyone. That's so funny. That's actually hilarious. I wasn't expecting the story to go there. I thought I was going to get like, kidnapped everyone to the Red Rocks. And <laughs> There's also uh, a in the back of the car in the parking lot, escape. Uh, uh, <laughs> double life. There was a whole double life. <laughs> No, that was quite an experience. It was such a dope experience with you all. Uh, happy to be back. Shoot, I was going to do a whole different song, but now I feel like I have to do Double Life if it was featured. Um, I'm in Saudi Arabia, which is funny, um, Khadija, because I'm here and you're in the States. <laughs> you still live here, but, um, and Bentley, because I know you're trying to get here for whatever reason. <laughs> yeah, I was in Saudi Arabia uh, in January. I was living there for a few, few years before coming back for the PhD here. Yeah. Uh, right, right, right. No, but I mean, the timing of coming like this time, um, who knows, but I was quarantined here. Anyways, um, it's 4 a.m. So I'm not going to do anything with the track just because we're right next to the mosque and this is life as I know it. So, <laughs> um, shoot, I guess I'll have to do double life after that intro. I was going to do a whole different, a whole different thing, but I guess we'll do double life acapella. Let's see how this goes. 
Uh, oh, lie, actually, I could bring, okay. Yeah, I'll keep the socks on. <laughs> I'm seeing all light. I'm seeing all light. I'm seeing all light. I'm seeing a light. I'm seeing all light. I'm seeing a light. Seeing all light. Oh, staring right into the light. Dark tunnels are out of sight. They're behind me. Now I'm climbing and extending to the sky beams. No, try to take this away. You cannot take this away. Double light, no. Double trouble, double strike. Higher than a night. Feet the words and it's a shy. I'm a bit Susania. What that he bit Amrikia. I'm a Kumia Mia. I'm a Hilwa Warazina. Baid min galbak out of mind. Lazen tafut what could take my time. I was doing Aston need to refine. Like in Aston had your time in a lifetime. The moon phases, I'm turning these pages. Dini hriya bust out of these cages. And her honey from international stages. Double light, no. Double trouble, double strife. Higher than a nice. Feet the words in it's the shine. To tell you the truth. Yeah, who I am is what I do. Us with bus was shoot. Inshallah, my legacy is proof. Ah. Let's leave it there. <laughs> Yo, we feel, we feel that Kamanja here with your voice. I love it. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, it leads into my first question for you here is that I, uh, the, mu the, mu the musicianship, I, I played, I was playing, training classical piano. I can't, I can't sing nothing. I could try, I could do a. Hey. You made it like Spanish. I like it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I the despacito pretty quick. Um, but one, the thing that I mentioned that struck me is like the use of the violin and your, I mean, with, with someone with, with knowledge of an instrument like this, I, I'm sure it impacts your music in some way. Do you want to talk about that? Where's that overlap? Where's that space? And what do you see for the future of your music in this regard? Uh, yeah, it's interesting. Like, I love the violin, but at the same time, I have a weird, like, I almost fear it. So I used to be, like, I started in symphony, and I was in orchestra for, like, since fourth grade, and then through college, and then I was in symphony, so I always had instruments around me, and I'd always just be, like, obsessed with the sound of, like, all the sounds, you know? And so I was never isolated. Like, even if it was, like, a little solar, it was just, like, there was always something around. And so it's, like, weird to break out of being classically trained into, like, breaking into like hip hop trap worlds like r b vibe trying to make it modern like such a classical instrument so um experimenting is weird because i'm so out of my comfort zone playing so many years like with like having like reading music like i'm classically trained so i'd always read like i'd have the notes so i knew exactly what to play so um it's been interesting finding my like expression with it and being free with it and being able to just create from the heart and so um yeah I've done like you know some trap violin like <laughs> hip-hop violin like I've been working on some weird Arabian violin sounds like I'm not like I don't know Sudani but like also something that can't it's just something 
in this Middle Eastern, out of African world, like, I don't know what sound I'm tapping into. Some people think it's like Turkish. I don't know what it is, but I've been trying to just like experiment a little bit more with it. So the future, I don't know. Hopefully it's just something that can resonate. Um, hopefully it's something that can bring healing. Like I think a lot of people always think of violence, like the womp womp, like sad instrument, like play the mini violin. But I think, you know, there's a lot of power in the emotion of it. Um, and I also think there's a lot of ways to blend like, you know, that power of healing with like something that's easy to vibe to and it's not like, I'm just you know, trying to meditate on it. So cool. we'll see. I love it. I love it. I love it. Um, <laughs> so my next question is uh, talking about the double life. So expanding on this a little bit, um, I, I guess it's like, it's like common, like third culture kid, like philosophy that you like, you feel like you fit in everywhere and you fit in nowhere at the same time. And you're talking exactly. about this double life. I'm curious, and you're in Sardia right now. Uh, you have Sudan and the U.S. also as homes. Is, it, is the double life different in each of those places? Or does it feel kind of the, the same vibe in each one? Um, definitely different. Sudan and the U.S. is kind of the same because I think even like a lot of Sudanese that are in Sudan still live like a similar lifestyle like as the U.S. that's like not as traditional as you know, generations before us. So, um, you know, like even within music and art and like how people socialize, it's different. So um, people are finding their own ways of expression and molding and like finding that the was in the balance and like, you know, um, I don't know. I just think it is different everywhere. Saudi is really hard. This is like, damn for some, <laughs> like, I feel like a huge culture shock totally unexpected and the double life is definitely different here you know like you wear the ambaya and then underneath it you know <laughs> it's like <laughs> um so yeah double life is different everywhere i think but i think it's more of like how you allow yourself to you know blend like you want to respect a culture and the place that you're in but at the same time you want to be true to yourself and you know like not conform and not lose yourself to some expectations so I don't know, I'm trying to just, I think the balance is when it's not harmful or like, you know, it's like not disrespectful, disrespectful but it's also empowering, mm -hmm. so. Awesome, well, thank you. And our, la our last quick question, we're, we're locating yourself, so you're in Sardia, where exactly? Riyadh. Riyadh, <laughs> all right, represent Riyadh. Not even Jeddah, I can't even be by the ocean. Jeddah, <laughs> <laughs> Totally unexpected, but yes, alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah for everything, so. Sounds good. Well, thank you so much for sharing and we look forward to the Q&A uh, afterwards. Uh, yes. We're going to move on to Rami. Uh, I had intentionally left Rami thinking that because he's in the UK that he would have to suffer the most and stay up latest, but Zainab's already taken that torch. So uh, commendations to, to Zainab. Rami, it's good to see you still awake. Uh, Rami is a rapper and an actor. Um, he was born in Alexandria, Egypt, emigrated to the United States in 1999. Uh, I want to point out this the same year my family moved to Chad uh, and settled in Kansas City. Right. Um, with the traditional Nubian and Sudanese songs that he listened to growing up and the new textures of music he discovered living in the US, he began writing his own songs during adolescence that reflected a wide range of musical influences. In 2012, he made his film acting debut by starring as Faisal in the short film Faisal Goes West. Um, this is an amazing film. I mean, unparalleled, true work of uh, intellectual creative genius. Um, how they pulled it off, I have no idea. Uh, and it uh, premiered at the 2013 Texas Independent Film Festival, um, as well as the uh, won an award at World Fest Houston International Film Festival and opened the first ever Sudan Independent Film Festival. So, I mean, that's, that's uh, man, that movie, when I think about it. Uh, all right, Faisal. Hey. How's it going? Rami and I have known each other for a long time. Um, and yeah. my, my lame joke there was because we worked on this film together, Faisal Goes West. But I think this one's kind of like changed both our lives <laughs> in a way. <laughs> yeah. um, I'm ever grateful for everything you put into that film. We really abused you and you took it in stride, um, which shows a lot. One of the forms of, uh, of, of 
abuse on poor Rami is that there's a scene in Faisal Goes West where Faisal, the main character, um, who has uh, is like going through all these hoops of like taking TOEFL and um, getting driver's, driver's license and all these kind of things, is driving a car and makes makes uh, a turn down a one-way street and um, is like super crunched on time that cannot does not have time to like even consider any other way to turn out and uh, does a parallel park like against the flow of traffic like illegally and everything. And since we were a low budget movie, we weren't able to block the street off. So there were, this was all done <laughs> completely like against the rules. And um, we totally put Rami in harm's way. Uh, what I love about this moment is that there was a museum goer who had who stepped out <laughs> and saw, where, saw Rami like driving the wrong way down the street and parking the car the wrong way and everything and offered to help teach him how to drive. <laughs> Um, and you handled it with, again, with uh, pure grace, uh, immense patience. I thought that was a very big accomplishment, Rami. So thank you and congratulations on that um, epic moment. Delighted to have you here tonight and delighted to hear from you. Um, Rami was in both Brooklyn and Denver. So he was at that uh, Stumbling is Not Falling art exhibit that Khalid al was uh, organizing, as well as the Safa Conference, both of which are featured in the film Revolution from Afar. That said, Rami, the floor is yours and welcome. All right, first of all, uh, thank you for having me be part of this. Um, uh, you know, just uh, very honored to be here with all the amazing uh, performers. Um, I'm going to perform a song called uh, The Martyr Song, and I'm going to do it a cappella as well because it's 2 a.m. and my wife is sleeping in the next room, and I'm going to have a very angry wife if I play music at this time of the night and wake her up. Um, this song was written, uh, a lot of people, uh, if you're first time hearing this, uh, my cousin was uh, actually uh, one of the early martyrs who was killed in the beginning of the revolution in uh, January 2019. And so I wrote this song and, uh, to honor him and honor all the people we lost um, in that struggle. Uh, <clears throat> it goes up. Uh, Breakfast is tear gas and burnt tires here. Digging in your flesh, bullets from the liars here. You put your fist in the air and walk through the fire here. 30 minutes later, your life will expire here. Promise you'll come back to me safe, your mama said. That's when you gon' feel the hollow tip drilling your head. You'll be sorry that you left her message on red. Before you can reply, they're going to shoot you dead. Last night in the cold, my sister faced the heat. This morning, we found her braided hair along the street. Same evening, she came back home, bruised up and beat. She refused to wear the uniform of defeat. Last week, my neighbor's kid went to play outside. Sharp teeth bullets would seek while he would hide. One bullet bit him on the neck, the other on the side. Now he's fast asleep on his last ride. If you ever wonder why I act so weird, you killed my brother and forced me to watch him bleed. A bullet in your heart is all I need. I can imagine revenge would taste so sweet. Does the pain ever go away? Hardly. Are the tears dripping down my face? Probably. Just imagine waking up and the first thing you see is your brother's soul leaving his body. Not life is shattered on my heart, not shailin ham. The study of the shaheed become. A shawar be a bar and see you will dumb. Lab nahaf min silah, la jihaz am. Gunasil mea gutta gasa sai. Gunasil mea gutta gasa sai. Gunasil mea gutta gasa sai. Yeah. Yeah. You guys all like, <laughs> I've heard these pieces before and it's still, it's still heavy each time. Uh, I really, really appreciate each and every one of you performing for us tonight and for your openness, your vulnerability. Uh, Rami, I remember something that you mentioned when we were in Brooklyn before performing uh, at the uh, Art X space. You were talking about how weakness, uh, emotional weakness, cr 
crying is not not looked at positively by um i would say probably like men <laughs> like yeah. a lot of men <laughs> a lot of like masculinism and a kind of that that general space yet each time you performed you were choked up and you 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 let it out like you you embrace that vulnerability uh you embrace that let's say weakness um, mm -hmm. And of course, it was very moving and very powerful for both the audiences that I witnessed. I think it was the one in New York started Hurriya Salamu Adada chant after yeah. you performed. Um, that was kind of a, a moment, like, whoa, this wasn't, this wasn't planned for, and it was super moving. Um, and the same thing in Denver. You, you had to take several breaks, turn around, get it together. And as you're doing that, people responded very encouragingly, very positively. Um, for you to keep going, you know? And I think it really begged a lot of that, that, that response that showed love and showed acceptance of what you have to share. But I'm curious, how do you reflect now on that statement um, about showing weakness or crying or emotion <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. and, and the, the sort of like conventions around that? Um, you know, when it first happened, like I always look back to the, uh, to the Denver performance. And uh, in a couple of days when the movie screens, you guys will be able to see it. Um, it. It comes unexpected. It's not like you go on stage expecting to be overwhelmed with emotion. Um, and I feel like every time I'm on stage, I just try to be as natural as possible. And I want to connect with the audience. And so um, when you get these emotions, the best thing to do is just, just let it be. Just be yourself. And uh, the feedback you get from the audience, you know, uh, that reflect to how well it connects. And um, I remember being on stage and I was looking down and I had to stop and I'm trying to gather myself because it's a very uh, personal song, right? And I could see people in the audience as well. Uh, there were some tears in the audience, right? And that kind of helped me get through that part and, and finish the song because I was like, well, it was kind of like looking at a mirror. I'm like, okay, so I'm not the only one in this building that's feeling these heavy emotions at the moment. So it kind of it helped me relax a little bit to know that, hey, there's people in the audience that can, uh, that can uh, relate to how I'm feeling, right? Looking back now, I'm glad, you know, I'm glad and I'm, I'm, I embrace that. Like there's no shame in it. I'm, I'm, I'm glad that I did that because I was able to get my message across and, and people felt it. Awesome, thank you. Um, with Revolution From Afar, my focus in telling the stories that we see and that we hear is to shed light on the complexities of the, the impact of the revolution, especially that feeling of being torn, not able to be physically in Khartoum or in Sudan in general during the revolution. Uh, and it's a very complex situation, like when the, when the internet was cut, there, like literally you could not get information from Sudan, people could, sneak around it a little bit but like there was a straight up silencing and with that is a question that was constantly coming up in conversations last year about agency and responsibility as an artist as a musician as a poet you're saying things that are very uh, energetically often in support of this movement in sudan but in the case of you and many others there's a, there's a risk associated. There's people that might, you know, hear what you have to say, be encouraged, and then go out and be subjected to violence. Mm -hmm. How do you deal with that as an artist? The question of expressing in support of the revolution, but also acknowledging the risk of people's lives actually being in danger. Mm -hmm. uh, so, I feel like as an artist, you have to speak your truth, right? And with me, every song I write, um, it's a reflection of the reality that I live in, you know? However, I've also made it very clear, even in when I tweet things out or whatever during the revolution, um, not just to myself, but I would make a note to other people in the diaspora to be very careful of trying to lead the revolution from afar, right? Um, a lot of times we might get this false idea that because we grew up in a certain place that we may know better or that we have what it takes to lead, but there are very well, uh, very amazing 
leaders who are capable on the ground. Their voices should be at the forefront in Khartoum. They're the ones that should be, um, should be heard by those people there on the ground. Right, and so let's, um, I've always been careful not to cross that line and try to put myself at the forefront of such movements. Um, when, I, when I release these songs, when I write them, I'm speaking um, my, my truth and, and, and I'm reflecting the reality that I, I live. Okay, uh, thank you. Yeah. I think we're at the point of the discussion where we're going to open it up. Check my notes here. We have some questions to start off with the, from the audience in the Q&A. So thank you again to all of our performers. It's been, as always, a super powerful moment and the ways in which you all address uh, just the, the beautiful nuances and struggles and uh, complexities in your work is, is very uh, influential. Let's start off with the question I have from, I believe it's Ammar. How do we find the middle of both of our cultures and how to express both of them? Yes, I may be American first, but my heart belongs in Lebanon. It hurts that I will never truly be fully Lebanese or fully American. How do you get out of this struggle of a cultural difference? And this was directed to Khadija. That's a heavy question that I'm still exploring myself, finding that balance between the American and the Sudanese, you know. Uh, but I think it's important to recognize for yourself that you are enough for both, that you don't have to choose one thing over the other, um, that we are all an accumulation of so many multiple identities and different cultures, different backgrounds, right? So. Uh, I find it beautiful uh, being a mosaic of so many different um, cultures and things that I can be proud of and roots that I can say proudly and uh, claim proudly, right? So we often think of identity as just like a, a one dimensional thing, but we have to recognize that it's a multitude of many and there is beauty in that. Um, so I think the most important thing is to recognize that for yourself, um, that you do not have to fit yourself into one box of identity that you can claim all of them at once, right? And even for me, like with the Sudan and the American, I find myself now creating my own culture, right? That I'm probably going to pass on to my future children, right? That um, I, I combine a whole bunch of things and I have friends from different cultures. Amar is my friend, she's loving, he's the girl who asked the question, um, very good friend of mine. So. I take stuff from the Lebanese culture, I take stuff from the Palestinian culture, I take stuff from the Pakistani and the Indian, the Bengali cultures, and I combine that all into my own um, separate culture, right? So um, the idea that we have to fit into one uh, should be discarded from our minds, and we have to claim um, what we want to claim and feel that we are enough for, for, for all of it. Excellent. Thank you, Khadija. I wanted to open it up to anyone else who had something to add on this question. Well, cool. Okay. Yeah, sure. No, uh, no offense taken. I can answer, yeah, Bentley. Go for it. Go for uh, it. I'll just add a couple um, points to Khadija's answer. Um, I noticed in your question that you said I'll never truly be fully fully um, Lebanon or Lebanese or fully American. I think that our definitions of what fully needs to change because it's really evolving. There is no such thing anymore as a pure Sudanese person because with globalization, technology, with the way culture has been shifting between borders, I don't think there's such a thing as fully. I think whatever you are right now, you are fully Lebanese and you're fully American. I don't think you're half half. I think you're a hundred hundred of each. And that just means you just have a little bit more than everybody else. Um, yeah. That's just my answer. Can I say something? Yes, you can. Yeah. No, uh, I've always looked at it like uh, actually recently, uh, like Khadija or I said earlier, I used to try to fight each side, right? I used to want to be 
Sudanese and not American and whatever. But um, I started looking at it like there's different layers. It doesn't have to be one or the other. I'm actually all of these things at once. And not only when I accepted that, but when I began to embrace it, that I really kind of felt peace, this inner peace. I don't have to, I don't, I don't need to let anyone define who I am. I'm all of these things. I can eat gurasa one day and you know what? I can have some Kansas City barbecue the next day. You know what I mean? <laughs> I'm all of these things at the same time. And I think it's a beautiful thing to, like Khadija said, just we have our own culture and our own identity that we create. And there's nothing wrong with that. Awesome. I'm going to go ahead and skip down the question and then we'll go back up to a question from Muhammad Sid Ahmad. What about the opposite of Amara's question, especially before the revolution? Did anyone feel Sudanese and then in parentheses or Lebanese, like for example, but not want to be? Like, has that changed maybe for you in recent years? Was this a question for? Uh, this is open to all performers. Finally, where is this question, by the way? These are in the Q&A box, so it's different than the chat. There's a Q&A tab. OK, um, I guess I can start with my answer for it, if I'm understanding it correctly. Um, before the Sudanese revolution, I not, it's not that like I wasn't proud of being Sudanese or anything like that, but I just felt very disconnected from Sudan, right? And like for me, I only was born in Sudan and then right after that, I was raised in Saudi and then immigrated to America, right? So it was always just the connection that I had with Sudan when we go to Sudan over the summer and we just like, you know, stay there for a month or two and then go back to our other homes, right? So uh, for me, I've always been outside of Sudan and felt very disconnected uh, from, from Sudan and didn't know the history, didn't really think about um, learning the history for myself or anything like that. Um, and it wasn't even until um, the start of the Sudanese revolution that we started even having these conversations in our house about our own family history, our own rich Sudanese history, my own family. Um, so definitely like as a result of the revolution, uh, I began being more proud of Sudan because I saw the people around me and I saw, I, I kind of was like, inspired by seeing youth like myself who are in the diaspora who are also now saying you know what like I need to learn more about myself because how can I know where I'm going if I don't know where I came from right so it, I, I think it's very important uh, to do that um, so definitely I think the revolution has been a great um, it, it sparked a great love uh, for Sudan within me as opposed to before I can also hop in on this question um, in terms of my relationship with Sudan before the revolution. As Khadija mentioned, it was kind of, it was, that's where I'm from. This is the cultural traditions that we follow. My family, this, I want to help Sudan. It was just very surface level. But I think during the revolution, I recreated my, uh, my relationship with Sudan because now I'm in the, now I'm a part of the community that's rebuilding it. and. And I'm seeing it become what I've always thought it could be. Before, I didn't have a personal connection. I didn't have a my connection to Sudan before was based off of trauma, to be honest. My family had to leave Sudan um, due to political asylum. My father was an oppositional leader. So the Bashir regime was the reason why we had to literally flee Sudan. So my whole life, that's the relationship I had with Sudan is they're the reason why I left and they're this and I can never go back. And, so my entire relationship with Sudan is just trauma, oppression, and then family and just culture, like that's it. But now it's like, now I have a relationship with music, Sudanese music, Sudanese rappers. I, I met Zainab and Rami last year through the revolution. So now I'm seeing different lights of Sudan that I'd never got to see before. And um, that's why I feel like I'm actually building a relationship with Sudan now. Excellent. All right, we'll uh, shift gears really quickly here. We have a question from an anonymous contributor. Let's see if I can get this 
right here. So with the Black Lives Matter movement, do you feel that the unity the Black community and our allies have created for the common goal of equality and justice, that you were able to create a home in America? Can you repeat it one more time? Yeah, uh, so it's, it's with the Black Lives Matter movement, do you feel that the unity of the Black community the unity the Black community and our allies have created for the common goal of equality and justice, you were able to create a home in America. I'm guessing, like, uh, were you, do you feel that you've been able to create a home in America? <laughs> uh, I mean, I'm kind of having a hard time understanding the question, but just based on what you said, uh, yeah, I feel like, again, it goes back to like, the place of belonging, um, you're never going to be, I feel like I'm never going to be accepted 100% on either side, right? Um, as far as Black Lives Matter is concerned and, and the situation right now in the U.S., um, as someone in the diaspora, um, you know, like if a police officer pulls you over and pulls a gun on you, he's not going to ask if you're Sudanese or not. They see skin color first. And there was actually a Sudanese man that was killed not too long ago. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Right? Um, so I feel like it's a global, uh, global blackness needs to understand this. And uh, I don't even know if I'm answering this the right way because I don't understand the question 100%, but I hope what I'm saying makes some sort of sense. <laughs> yeah, it did reference like recent developments, but you all moved yeah. to the United States a long time ago <laughs> before those recent developments. So I got you. But I think any of the question is very valid about, yeah, have you been able to craft a home? Yeah. Do you feel... Uh, welcome. One of the Khadija's comments in one of our discussions was that, yeah, you can you can sit here. It's kind of what you were saying, Rami. You can sit here and identify as this, 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 and that. But at the end of the day, you're black to the system. So, you know. Um, yeah. Anyone else have anything to add to that question? All right. We can move on. Oh, we have some. <laughs> <laughs> I unmuted it for a second. I know the question was kind of, but I think I get to where they're going with it. And that's just like allyship and feeling a sense of belonging in a place that wants to marginalize certain populations, immigrants, Muslims, gays, LGBTQ community, you know what I mean? Blacks, Black Americans. So I think <clears throat> allyship is crucial to feeling like you have a home because you have a sense of belonging. And a sense of understanding within your community. And I think that's what everyone's seeking. And even like Sudan is evolving into a place where like Medina and now the community can evolve in little ways, like by having allies for domestic violence, for, you know, women's rights, for uh, helping the youth <clears throat> and all kinds of efforts. So, um, yeah, I don't know, I've, my home, made homes in the U.S., so I don't really know, but allyship is key. That's my <laughs> success. <laughs> okay, next we have a question from Lauren. Uh, people talk about the revolution in the past tense, but what do you think the reality is for a true change in Sudan, and what will it take to get there? So we kind of talk about the revolution as, ah, oh, it came and went, um, but there's definitely an ongoing struggle. So what are your thoughts on that? And I want to add to that um, a question that Esther has contributed. What are your hopes and fears for Sudan at this stage of the revolution? So I feel like uh, we, speak, we speak in the revolution in the past tense. Uh, because that's what was in, uh, in the spotlight at that moment in time. Uh, the reality, however, is much different than that, right? Uh, there was just a million person march a few days ago. Uh, for us to see real change in Sudan, I feel like it's very important for us to understand the dynamics of Sudan and Sudanese culture and Sudanese history. Um, for example, imagine how someone from Darfur right now feels to see Himeti at the forefront of this so-called change happening in Sudan. And people in Khartoum 
whether they know it or not, the reality is this man is a, he's a warlord, he's a murderer, right? Um, it's, it's very uncomfortable, right? How can we talk about change and how can we talk about, um, how can we pretend like there's real change happening when an entire portion of the population who had to witness their families and their homes being burnt down and such, and, and the man that's responsible for it, partially responsible for it is now, really he has the highest seat in Sudan, right? If we, all titles aside and, right? Just, just seeing it for what it is, he's the most powerful man in the country at the moment. Um, it's uncomfortable for us to talk about these things, but they need to be brought up to the table and discussed because for Sudan to truly evolve and, and, and for us to truly have peace, there needs to be peace for all Sudanese people, not just a portion of the population. And that begins with us having these discussions about the history and the different cultures. And I don't wanna drag this on, but one more thing is that the identity of Sudanese culture itself, what defines Sudanese culture? Sudanese culture is an umbrella of, of, of cultures within that umbrella of Sudan. There's not one thing called Sudanese culture, right? If you go to East Sudan, it's gonna be completely different than if you're in Khartoum, than if you're in Nuba Mountains, than if you're in Al Fashir, than if you're in Dungula. And so we need to know each other. We need to understand who we are as a people and accept each other, learn to accept our, uh, and embrace our um, diversity as Sudanese people. Thank you, Rami. I have a question. It's a perspective here from Adel, which might be related. And so feel free to answer the previous one, sort of like the, it's kind of a big question about the future of Sudan um, and as well as the sort of the revolutionary, ongoing revolutionary struggle. Uh, Adel writes, for some of us, Sudan under the regime of Bashir is synonymous with a closed society, inward looking, isolated, shunning of the African and ancient facet of its identity and skeptical about joining the liberal world order. We have had to get used, to, sorry, to get accustomed to a Sudan that is very different than that of our parents' generation and prior. How do you feel about the potential role of artists to help larger society embrace and explore multiple identities that have become a part of the diaspora, as well as a large and open-minded and long resistant segment of the population? And that's for everyone. You're welcome to answer. Uh, thank you so much for that comment. I was so beautifully put. Um, I would, I definitely agree with you. I think artists play a pivotal role because they are a reflection of the people, what the people want. Um, so I think artists have a responsibility to keep reflecting um, what the people want and what they want and to use and to have platforms to do that on. So I think us as a community, um, adding on to the previous question is, what type of Sudan do I want to see? I think we have incredible artists in Sudan and performers and dancers, but just investing in them for uh, resources, for opportunities and things like that. I think a huge theme that we had for this conversation is realizing that we played a role in the revolution from afar, but a lot of homage and respect needs to be given to the folks who have been on ground in Sudan and doing a lot of the heavy lifting and our job as artists from the diaspora has always just been to give them the microphone, give them the platform, give them the resources. So I feel like artists are going to play a role in the revolution. So these are our voices from the diaspora, but I encourage everyone in this um, Zoom today is to reach out um, and follow artists who are based in Sudan. So that's an opportunity to do that. I mean, but Bayadid and Rami, you guys answered that so beautifully. And uh, I really don't have much to add to that other than um, highlighting and emphasizing what Bayadid has said about artists is that, you know, literally artists are the narrators of history as it's happening, right? So they tell our stories and they magnify them. And, you know, people need to listen to that because, um, you know, like you said, Bayadid, they are reflecting um, the people and what's going on there. Um, so definitely, I think it's important to 
uh, uplift those voices in Sudan, uh, outside of Sudan, because we're just as Sudanese as well, but definitely the people in Sudan. Um, and uh, like Rami said, we definitely need to learn more about the, the diverse culture, cultures that exist within Sudan. I think oftentimes we get stuck into thinking that there is one uniform Sudan uh, with one group of people, but we neglect to remember that there are so many different languages in Sudan, so many different religions, so many different um, groups of people, right, that we need to celebrate and we need to highlight and we need to uplift and we need to magnify their voices as well. Uh, because like, if, if we are not all free, like Sudan will not be free. Uh, and I think oftentimes we chain each other um, and that we need to begin um, freeing ourselves by ourselves with each other. So I think that's really, really important and a really important discussion and dialogue to have. Thank you, Khadija. We have a question from Hamid al-Hassan. Uh, will there be any way to watch the film streaming? And the good news, I can answer this one, the good news is that yes, indeed, next Thursday, July 9th, the film will be available to stream. As long as you've signed up for the Rising Up Sudan series, you'll receive a link with a password to stream the film throughout the day of Thursday, July 9th, leading up to uh, an awesome celebration of the film uh, many of the faces you see tonight will be back next week, in addition to others. It'll be sort of like our premiere that we can celebrate together, as we haven't been able to do something like that in person quite yet. So next week, that will be available for you. Thank you, Muhammad, for the question. All right, from another uh, Muhammad. So Muhammad Sid Ahmed, I keep wanting to say Mustafa Sid Ahmed. So the follow-up, Muhammad uh, asked a question earlier. Um, and I want to just select a part of this. Muhammad asked about what about the disconnect, D-I-S-S -S connect. We've already mentioned the disconnect between cultures, the disconnect. Um, I guess I'm asking about national identity. Isn't it restrictive, even with the positive feelings uh, after the revolution? Uh, can you hear it one more time again? It's uh... so so. Muhammad's asking about national identity. So, isn't mm -hmm. national identity restrictive, even with the positive feelings after revolution? So, we've already asked. I think he asked earlier about um, the idea of like not connecting to Sudan, and then maybe having that sort of change throughout this process. I would add, from my perspective, like not connecting to America as well. Like Khadija mentioned earlier, sort of like the idea of claiming Sudanese identity at a younger age and how that sort of evolved for her. Like for me, myself, like I've, had, I've gone through stages of my like adolescence where like, I didn't want have anything to do with America. Uh, or the, then it was Chad, then it was the both. And then, was, you know, so um, what about the national identity? Could it be restrictive? I'm guessing in sort of like describing maybe who you are, um, even with the positive connotation associated around a nationality uh, and a movement, for example, like the Sudanese revolution. Yeah, I feel it can be restrictive. And um, a lot of times we do ourselves a disservice by trying to box, put ourselves in, in, in one box. And Bentley, probably more than any of us here, <laughs> can relate to that. I mean, he is he American? Is he is he from Chad? Is right? And and growing up in Chad, I'm sure he faced certain uh there were certain aspects of 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 him also feeling that um was he welcomed as a as, as a Chadian or was he looked at as the white American guy that what that, that that plays soccer with us and so uh, I think anyone that has this uh, that, that kind of lived this dual has this dual identity uh, multiple identity thing going on in their lives can relate to that and and I feel that in one way or another it can be restrictive if you try to force yourself in one box. Yeah, adding on to Rami's point, I definitely, I definitely agree. And then, um, not only do you put yourself in a bag, uh, in a box, you, you, you just take baggage with you. You take all the historical trauma with you. You, just, you take everything that comes with it, the perceptions of being Sudanese and from Africa, or being uh, the perception of being from America and the stereotypes folks have. Um, so when I claim America, when I go to the state uh, Sudan, folks think I'm bougie or they think I'm 
rich or, or anything like that. So I think nationality um, causes internal restrictions, but also the way that the world sees us. Excellent. Uh, Zaina, do you have something? Um, um, that question, I know I'm trying to figure out the nationality piece because I feel like, you know, after the revolution, you want to connect. I think that led us all to connect more with Sudanese and being Sudanese and embracing ourselves in that nationality. And in that respect, I guess, it's different on what's on our passport and what's you know, stamped on our hearts. But <laughs> I think even the distance, the separation of physically being in a place while the revolution is going on is distancing. You can't, don't feel as involved. You don't feel the effects of what's actually happening from the revolution emotionally, physically, mentally. So um, I think it's, it's a balance of all that, of the space and having support and understanding what's happening and, you know, discovering your identity through that wherever you fit, whether it's from afar supporting or you're in the mix. Um, yeah. Sorry, it's so early, you guys. <laughs> it's 5.30. I'm trying to stay focused. But we appreciate that's my, it. That's my sense. <laughs> Thank you, Zaina. Thank you. Awesome. Um, we have a, we're going to do a couple more questions here before we wrap up. And uh, I think Ruth Ann will take over and offer some more comments about the, the whole month. And we'll get to get a chance to see the trailer of Revolution from Afar. That'll be our closing moment tonight. Um, let, me, let me take a question here from Lee. Lee says, you all are awesome. Thanks, Lee. Uh, thank you for your art and passion. It is important and inspiring. One question, what role do you see that the Sudanese diaspora could now play to help develop a vibrant cultural space in the new Sudan? Not only in Khartoum, but all over the country. And if I can editorialize this a little bit, um, there, let's, let's be real. There's, we've talked about disconnect, we've talked about the challenges of identity. There can be some differences between the perspective of Sudan from outside Sudan and the perspective of people within Sudan. And I would say within Khartoum and the other parts of Sudan. I remember things that we would see, like when I was living in Damazin or Kadugli, these places, people in Khartoum had no idea these things were happening. And there, there are like layers of discourse spaces happening here. But Lee's asking, what, what do you see as the role? Like, how could diaspora play a role in uh, developing a vibrant cultural space in Khartoum, but also outside? And you're free to answer as you please. Um, honestly, I think is our role as a diaspora <clears throat> having resources um, from the outside, from places that are, you know, have, are more technologically advanced. And there's a lot of things we could bring to helping the community develop and bringing resources and helping organize and, you know, show people like how dope a concert could be with visuals in the background. And like, um, and I think people are doing it on their own, but I think there's a different level of organization and access to resources that we could provide to help support. And also just having like the groundwork foundation set in other, country being the diaspora and more developed countries having art galleries and having that be a more regular part of the culture but I think it could be integrated in a way <clears throat> that is still um, authentic to the Sudanese culture and tradition and allowing the culture in Sudan to elevate to the same ways we see you know western culture elevated in media in events in just public spaces and transforming the community into that and I think it's already happening with like art you know like there's so many more murals since revolution and people are you know coming out as artists and singers and everything and so I think it's just a matter of having like guidance to kind of embrace that and how to package it and to be successful you know and I think um just I think we could provide just resources and experience and um support you know and also help promote people and get their get them outside of Sudan and get them known you know in other places that they wouldn't be able to access um so yeah there's definitely a huge cultural scene right now in Sudan um I can definitely name a couple of people that I'm a fan of um 
and I think that came during the revolution, really had their spotlight, like Asil Liab, she um, is a graffiti designer and spray paints um, uh, walls, of, walls of the homes of martyrs, um, and she spray paints their, um, their, their mural. Also, Merja Saleh also does incredible mosaic pieces. Personally, um, my book has illustrations from a Sudanese-based designer, Sport Jr. So these artists exist, they're doing amazing. It's more so just inviting them to the conversation, inviting them to the table, giving them the resources. And, um, and when we say resources, I mean money. <laughs> I mean money, I think that's what they need. Like these people are so talented. It's just more so how can I bring a Sudanese artist to the conversation? How can I uplift them? How can I share their page versus somebody else? You know, yeah, Asil Diab, I'm so glad you're familiar um, with her. So yeah, they, the cultural scene in Sudan already exists. Are, the issue is that people aren't just people aren't looking for it. Um, but yeah, I just hope people actively look for it. Um, and I think, certainly, sorry for jumping a little too ahead. There was another question in the chat box about um, people's perception about Sudan and like their relationship and like tourism, how that's an opportunity. Um, I see that as an opportunity for Sudan's future as well to um, show people that this is a tourist spot that. Um, can bring more attraction. Awesome. Um, this is a great, great tie in just to really, really quickly plug the other events of the series. In addition to the screenings, there will be a discussion called Who's Sudan on July 11th, a little bit earlier during the day for people to tune in in different countries. Um, that Rami, who's here tonight, will be a part of. Uh, alongside Dao Doldol, Hajar Mohammedin, and uh, Wafa Said. So uh, I guess Hajar and then Rami and Wafa to an extent, we're all, well, Wafa is like a super organizer of the Sata conference. <laughs> we're all heavily involved in the film Revolution from Afar uh, as well. And we're excited to, to see that conversation alongside Dao. Um, then there will also be an event on the 18th, I believe, in art and activism. This is around the film uh, I Am Bisha. And someone who has been mentioned earlier, we have Asil Diab, but also uh, Khalid Abbe, who organized the Stumbling Is Not Falling exhibit in New York. Um, he's someone who has, he mentions in the film, he's actually spent a lot of his life, well, maybe you could call it maybe all of his life outside of Sudan. And so um, for him, the internet is a sort of home. And it's very interesting to see how he chooses to navigate that idea of being outside Sudan and but still embracing agency within what, what happens in Sudan. Um, and Khaled also has done numerous collaborations with artists in Sudan, um, graphic designers and uh, animators and um, designers of all sorts uh, in an attempt to re-educate, to tell new narratives, um, narratives that embrace uh, a, a diversity and a, and a uh, non-colonial version of, of Sudan. So those, there's some really exciting things that are going on. All right, I am delighted uh, to have all you guys here tonight. Uh, this has been a really, really nice talk. I'd like to thank everyone who has contributed questions in our Q&A um, field. I hope we can keep this discussion going. Uh, I hope that people can connect more and that we can cross these borders and cross these cultural divides in ways that are uh, productive, uh, collaborative, and that um, respects human rights, right? So uh, please, uh, everyone, uh, round of applause for each other. Thank you so much for being a part of this. And I'd like to give you a really brief, uh, quick final remark if you can. Tell us how to follow you, how to connect, what's your What's your new album? What's your new book? All my social medias at Real Rami Daoud. You can follow me, um, hear what I have to say. I actually have a new song releasing tonight, uh, Midnight in New York Time. So just in a few hours, it's featuring a Sudanese American artist by the name of Odyssey. And it is a song called The Strife. And The Strife is a battle that we have growing up. It's a battle of identity. It's a battle of uh, you know, Sudanese culture being enforced at home and the appeal of American street culture as well. So I would appreciate the support if you guys, yeah, featured on all, all, all platforms, Spotify, Apple Music, YouTube, all of that good stuff. Um, at Real Rami Daoud 
all my social medias. If you can follow me, check out what I have to say, and I'll follow back most of the time. So I appreciate the support. Um, I'll keep it on the music flow since we're <laughs> talking about platforms. Um, I'm at Zayna Music, and that's Z A N I B. Everywhere Zayna Music. Um, and then yeah, all streaming platforms: YouTube, um, House Party. You know, I don't know. <laughs> uh, but yeah, feel free to find me. I'll definitely love to connect. Thank you all so much again, and. I appreciate everyone's amazing performances and the insightful conversations as always. Bentley always sparks such, such brilliance and I really do appreciate you. So, <laughs> you guys um, can find me on social media, on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook, your, ba your Bea, um, and that's B your, Y-O-U-R-B-A-Y-A, -A. Um, my book, Secondhand Smoke is my debut poetry book. Uh, it's titled Secondhand Smoke based off the poem I read. Also has illustrations from Sport Junior Sudanese based illustrator and it can be purchased on yourbayazid.com. All right, so I don't have anything to plug, but you can follow me at the Khadija Mo, T-H-A-K-H-A-D-E-G-A-M-O. Um, honestly, I shocked myself. I don't know what I'm about to do next. We'll find out. I don't know. Follow me. We'll see. Maybe some new spoken word, um, possibly a podcast. But I'm always just, you know, speaking truth to power on my platform. So join me on there, inshallah. <laughs> the Khadija Ma. Awesome. Thanks again. Thanks again to everyone. Um, thanks again to the Never Again Coalition. Thanks. I see uh, Farid is contributing here in the comment box from SAPA, another organization we've kept mentioning these are these are organizations that are they're a lifeline to these discussions right now um I, as a filmmaker i was scared to death how i'm going to be able to get this film out it was a film that i you know as i go through post-production i'm trying to get it out rapidly to where it'd be part of the discourse and then suddenly with the covid lockdown everyone's isolated we're all far we're all watching every revolution from afar now <laughs> in a way uh, so to have an organization like this never again coalition um to reach out in such a personal uh, and supportive manner just means a lot to me personally. And I, and I hope it's been something for everyone here tonight. Uh, gives us something to look forward to, uh, gives us the hope that, that, that the discussion is ongoing, that voices are being heard, and that's infinitely valuable. So huge thanks to Never Again Coalition. Uh, really hope to see you guys, everyone, at the future events as part of, of Rising Up Sudan. Uh, I think we're going to turn it over to Ruth Ann now, and we'll close with a trailer for Revolution from afar. Awesome. Thank you so much, Bentley. And we have people in the chat asking where they can find all of our performers. If you all just want to throw your um, links into the chat so the whole audience can get them, that would be amazing. Um, I want to thank our all of our co-presenters. We have a huge number of organizations that when we reached out to them and we told them about the series and that we wanted to do it and they were so eager and so enthusiastic to be part of it. I think it just really speaks um, to how broad a range of supporters there are for peace and justice and accountability in Sudan and democracy. Very importantly, I want to just list them all. In addition to us, Never Again Coalition, there's also World Oregon. Amnesty International USA Group 48, which is our local group here in Oregon, Portland State University's Holocaust and Genocide Studies Project, Portland State University's Conflict Resolution Program, and Portland State University's Middle East Studies Center, the Oregon Jewish Museum and Center for Holocaust Education, Sudanese American Public Affairs Association, IACT, STAND, ACT for Sudan, Cool Islam, Sudan Unlimited, and the Cascade Festival of African Film. So I want to thank them all for their support and for promoting our event. And, um, you know, we had no idea when we started planning this, when I started talking to Bentley a few months ago, and um, we had this wonderful Sudan event emerge um, as its own entity from our, our May series that we put together. Um, we had no idea what context this was going to be taking place in, and that we would be in the middle of this massive global uprising 
um, for racial justice and a conscious dismantling of the racist structures that have caused so much harm, not just in the USA, but in Sudan and all around the world, wherever they're happening, they're causing harm clearly. Um, and I, I just think it's been particularly relevant and timely and just really exciting to be able to amplify the voices of you all as artists and your messages and your um, just your, your, your insights, your reflections, your experiences, and then the way that you're really speaking to these things with so much power and so much passion. And so I would just wanna thank you all for that, for sharing your heart, your words, your art. Um, but yeah, Dara, as you, as you mentioned, it could be really vulnerable to put all of these things out in the space and you just all do it in such a beautiful and really powerful and compelling way. And it's just so, so excited that we've, we've, we've met you and that we're able to bring your voices out to whoever is watching tonight or whoever's gonna be watching the recorded version. Um, Bentley, thank you so much for your skillful moderating. It's been a pleasure. I'm so excited to see Revolution from afar next week. If you're registered for the series, you're gonna get a link to stream it next week. And then you'll be seeing many of these same faces um, next week after the screening to talk more about the film, including Makawi Makawi, the producer, and many more members of the cast and crew of Revolution from Afar. So make sure you're there for that. If you haven't registered yet, you can register at www.neveragaincoalition.org forward slash rising up forward slash Sudan. That's where you can find us. Please do, please share it. Um, also, please support these artists. We um, are, are really lucky that they're sharing their time with us, their energy for free. Um, we, are, we are taking donations for our series now and hope that we can offer, offer something to our artists in the future for participating. I want you, if you feel like donating money, please, or you feel like purchasing music, books, please give it to the artists first. If you still have some left over, give it to our series and, and we'll keep bringing you this, this amazing programming. So we're gonna end with the Revolution trailer and we'll see you all hopefully next week. Trying to swim between spirit and exuberance between two lands that were never meant to be between chaos. The people of Sudan always have peace with us. Bentley, can you turn it up a little bit? We can't hear. Arabic tongue and black skin, between Eddie Beta and ABC, between black dress and white toe, between pizza and I'll see the women that go between La Kida and no, that's okay, between Hope and A and oh my god, between what is he and too far, between WhatsApp calls and TV screens, between immigrants and citizens. Oh, no, 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 no,